Hey everyone, it's Christy. I did some research the other night. I looked up the phrase, like, how many feminists are there in the United States? Because I hadn't seen polling data lately. And I found this report in the Washington Post from January of 2016. I thought I would review it because the data are really interesting when you compare it to the YouTube bubble, especially the anti-feminist safe space comment section bubble that a lot of people who enjoy watching anti-feminist content inhabit. Cross-checking the norms of, of YouTube and the patterns of YouTube against reality and the real population and how people think in the real world, not just in the YouTube bubble, is useful. Therefore, I'm presenting this information to give some balance uh, and bring some reality to the discussion. I'm going to be reviewing a national survey by the Washington Post and Kaiser Family Foundation that found that six in ten women and one-third of men call themselves a feminist or a strong feminist, with roughly seven in ten of each saying the movement is empowering. Yet, over four in ten Americans see the movement as angry, and a similar proportion say it unfairly blames men for women's challenges. Younger women are more optimistic about movement across a variety of measures, and more than 4 in 10 say they've expressed their views about women's rights on social media. When we come to the end of the review, I want to read out a little bit more about how the survey was conducted and weighted, but at the moment I'm just going to get right into the data. The first question was, do you consider yourself to be a strong feminist, a feminist, not a feminist, or an anti-feminist? You'll notice that this is different from just asking, do you identify yourself as a feminist? It's giving people options in terms of the kinds of ways they can identify. And when you do that, if you look in the left-hand column, you'll see that 10% of men in that sample identified themselves as strong feminist, 23% of the men in the sample identified as feminist, half of the men who were interviewed did not identify as a feminist, only 5% of men I am who took part in the survey identified themselves as anti-feminist, and 12% had no opinion. On the other side of the column, we can see that 17% of women identified themselves as strong feminist, not quite as many, twice as many as men, but still a, a pretty good portion. 43% of women consider themselves feminist. 30% consider themselves not a feminist, that's compared with 50% of men, obviously, only 2% of women identified themselves as anti-feminist, and 7% had no opinion. Obviously, as a movement that's goal is to improve and raise women's status in the social, political, economic, religious, and sexual spheres, it makes more sense that women are going to be identifying as feminists. But I'm very, very heartened by the fact that a third of men in the sample, and therefore generalizable to the wider population with a margin of error of around 5%, men are identifying as feminists. And I think that's a, a really good sign. It shows that the kind of uh, divisions in, in second wave feminism, that, you know, like sort of men, men felt more excluded, those barriers are coming down and it's being seen as a, a wider and broader movement that is inclusive of women and men who support the same goals. Age cohorts play a role throughout the distribution of responses in what we're about to review here. And we can see here the first example of those cohort differences. If you ask women between the ages of 18 and 34, 63% identify themselves as strong feminists or feminists. That means for the future, we've got a really great group of women who uh, identify themselves as feminists and are going to be taking those attitudes forward. In comparison, you can see with my cohort, which is the 35 to 49 year olds, just over half, 51% of women in that cohort identified themselves as either a strong feminist or a feminist. Those numbers bump up for women who were directly involved in second wave feminism in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. 50-year-olds to 64-year-old women, 68% of them identified as either a strong feminist or feminist. And for women age 65 and older, 58% identified as either strong feminist or feminist. So it's really the cohort that fell between the rise of second wave feminism and the rise of third wave feminism, that's my generation, that are the least likely to identify as feminists. All the other women around us in various cohorts identify as feminists at a much higher rate. The next question we're going to review is whether the feminist movement today is focused on changes that you want or not. And this was directed at women who responded to the survey. 
in that general overall category, 48% of women said yes, the feminist movement today is focused on changes that they want, 17% had no opinion, and 35% said no. This again depends a lot on how old you are. If we look below at the responses by age group, we'll see that for women aged 18 to 34, 58% of them said yes, fem the feminist movement today is focused on the changes that they want. Only 28% said no. In the next cohort of 35-year-old to 49-year-old women, half, 50%, said yes, the feminist movement is focused on the changes they want. 39% said no, and 11% had no opinion. For those aged 50 to 64, 43% said yes, 37% said no, and 20% had no opinion. And for women over the age of 60, it's the only case where the no's outweigh the yeses, barely. 38% of women over the age of 65 thought the feminist movement today is focused on changes that they want, 39% said no, and 23% had no opinion. To me, what I read here is that the feminist movement is being driven by this younger cohort who are more self-identifying, uh, we'll, we'll see more expressive in social media, and who are talking about things that are relevant to them. And that relevance is obviously the, not quite the same thing as what women who are 65 are, are, have faced, and they may not relate to it. So we do see some generational differences here, but really when we look again, looking forward, we see a lot of women in that younger cohort who are identifying as feminists or strong feminists, and we see that they feel that the movement reflects the changes that they want. The next graphic represents people's responses to words that they associate with feminism. When asked, do you think these words describe feminism in the United States, when they put the word angry to respondents, 43% said yes, it describes feminism in the United States, 54% said no, it doesn't, and 3% had no opinion. To be sh make sure that I had not just gotten the women's pr responses, I did look at this particular question in the cross tabs, and I can give you the cross tabs on that. So overall, in total, 43% said yes to angry being an accurate descriptor, 54% said no, 3% no opinion. When you asked women, 39% of women said yes, the word angry describes it, 56% said no. 46% of men said the word angry describes it, and 52% said no. So when it comes to that 43, you can see that there's it's averaging the difference between the men and the women in the sample, and men see feminism as being more angry than women do. And I think that's, I, we'll talk about that and unpack it a little bit more later, but it's these sex differences in age cohorts are important to take into consideration when looking at the overall numbers. When asked if the word outdated described feminism in the United States, 30% said yes, 66% said no, and 4% said had no opinion. Finally, when looking at the results, when asked if empowering described feminism in the United States, 70% of all the respondents said yes, 26% said no, and 4% had, had no opinion. When it comes to breaking down the empowering question, by the way, um, I'll just say since I'm already doing it, the outdated was almost identical for men and women. So when it comes to feminism being outdated, women were at 30% and at yes, and 65 were no. Men were 30% yes and 68% no. And that averages out then to 30% saying yes overall outdated and 66% saying no overall. When looking at the breakdown by sex on the question of whether the word empowering describes feminism. 69% of women said yes, 26% of women said no, 71% of men said yes, and 27% said no. So there were fewer no opinions in the men's responses. But it, and of course it's, it's within the margin of error, but in this particular sample, the point estimate, men actually in this sample were slightly more likely to say that they thought that feminism today could be described by the word empowering in terms of the US feminist movement. The next graphic breaks down the outdated by, in this case, women's responses by their age cohort again. And this gets back to this pattern of younger women seeing the world differently than their grandmothers. Only 16% of women aged 18 to 34 think the word outdated describes feminism compared with 37% of women who are 35 to 49, 37% of women who are 50 to 64, and 33% of women who are aged 65 or older. 
you see a pattern here of younger women being more engaged and more enthusiastic than older than their older cohorts, which to me indicates that feminism is certainly a social movement that is going to continue to be active and working on issues inside and outside the United States for decades to come. In terms of the word empowering, while all women overwhelmingly associated the word empowering with feminism, 83% of 18 to 34 year olds think feminism is empowering. 68% of 35 to 49 year old women thought so. Women aged 50 to 64, 64% of them thought that feminism is empowering. And for women aged 65 and older, 56% thought feminism is empowering. If you got your information about feminism from only Thunderfoot and Sargon of Akkad, you would think that feminism is just a bunch of shrill women who um, man-hate and make ridiculous claims. But is this a perception in the wider population? No. <laughs> When asked if the feminist movement unfairly blames men for women's challenges, overall 46% said that it was true, 49% said it was not true, and 5% had no opinion. But a difference here is that we should look at by who is responding. When you ask women if the feminist movement unfairly blames men for women's challenges, 41% of women say that that comment is true. 54% say that it's not true. Those numbers are almost inverted for men. So 52% of men in the sample said the feminist movement unfairly blames men for women's challenges, and 43% said that, that comment is not true. This is an example of where you stand depends on where you sit. And for women, when they talk about the problems that they face with systematic sexism, they can talk about it and not necessarily mean that they're blaming any one individual man, unless, of course, like Donald Trump, he's responsible for his actions and his words. But the audience of that men does seem to be the fact by this data that they hear a discourse that's directed more personally at them in a way that other women don't hear men being blamed when feminism is discussed. So when critiques are being made of patriarchy, of male power, of male privilege, women are less likely to perceive that as being directly blaming men, and men are more likely to take it personally. The next question I will review, but I'm not happy with the wording of the question or the wording of the answer, but let me present it first and then I'll present a critique. Which of the following do you think is a bigger factor keeping women from achieving full equality with men? The choices women make themselves, discrimination against women, both, or some other, I uh, don't know. In terms of women respondents, women themselves thought that choices that women make themselves, 44% of all the respondents thought that that was the bigger, bigger factor keeping women from achieving full equality. 44% thought it was discrimination against women. 8% replied both, and 5% had no opinion. The reason that I have a problem with this, the way that this question response is worded, is that, is the fact that the United States is basically one of two countries now that doesn't have some sort of form of paid family leave, is that her choice? So is she making that choice to impoverish herself because the United States fails women in a way that other countries do not? Or is it discrimination against women and men who are having families that that particular life cycle need or that life event need is not being accounted for by the state in the same way that it does in other, basically every other nation in the world? My objection, therefore, is not with the distribution of responses. It's that I don't understand what respondents were thinking of when they were making their choice based on what's here in the question. And that makes me think that if we would unpack this a little bit more, if we would have had a, an open-ended question rather than you have to choose A, B, or C, we might have gotten better answers. The next question asks whether or not you've ever voted for a candidate because of their position on women's rights. And it found that women ages 50 to 64 have done so more than any other age group. Not men, just women in this case. My, There's a little bit, I think, of a spurious correlation going on here. And that is because if you're, if you've lived to the age of 64, you've been able to vote in a lot of elections and you've been able to vote for a lot of different reasons. And so you had more opportunity to cast a vote for a candidate because of that candidate's position on human, on women's rights, human rights, equal rights, you know. In comparison, if you're only 18 or 22, 
you've probably only lived through one presidential election, and you might not have voted for the president or members of Congress in this election on the issue of women's rights, but you haven't lived long enough to actually make that decision. So I think that I would prefer to see an ordinary, some sort of ordinary least squares regression on this question rather than saying, oh, older women are more likely to vote for a candidate based on women's rights than younger women, simply because there's an issue of an opportunity to vote that the younger women haven't had. That being said, the sample results are that 40% of women in the sample said they had voted for a candidate because of the candidate's support on women's rights or of women's rights, whereas 26% of men had done so. And it just, it makes sense in terms of the constituency, right? If you're a member of the Chamber of Commerce, or you're a member, you're a member of a farmer's association, if you're a member of a women's group, when politicians campaign, they speak in a way to, un to connect what their policies are to the communities that they are trying to get votes from. Therefore, when candidates spend time talking about the things that are of concern to women, it makes sense that women will then respond to that and vote for the candidate because of their candidate's position on that. And I'll just go over the voting cohort distributions for the sake of it, but again, I'm throwing in my own cautionary tale here that we shouldn't read too much into this data simply because younger women's cohorts have had fewer elections to participate in. So in terms of ever having voted for a candidate because of the candidate's support for women's rights, 37% of women aged 18 to 34 had said yes to that question, versus 63% who said no. Of women aged 35 to 49, 40% said yes, 57% said no. For women aged 50 to 64, 49% said yes, and 49% said no, while women aged 65 and older, 36% said they had voted for a candidate because of his or her support for women's rights, whereas 63% said no. In terms of activism, you've got somewhere between 13 and 17% of women in the sample who have contacted by phone, writing, or email a public official expressing their view on women's rights. And in terms of expressing views on women's rights on social media sites like Facebook and Twitter, Almost half of women under the age of 34, 18 to 34, have done that. That's 45% said they have expressed views on social media about women's rights. 34% of women 35 to 49 did. Women aged 50 to 64, only 20% did. And aged 65 and older, only 9% did. Clearly, that's another cohort effect. Before moving on to the more technical aspects of the sampling, I just want to throw in one more section from the article to do with the way the question was worded. How many feminists are there? Polls have found that the number of Americans who identify as a feminist depends on how the question is asked. The Post-Kaiser's survey question, first asked in a 1986 poll by Newsweek and Gallup, found 47% of Americans identifying as a strong feminist or a feminist, while 44% identified as not a feminist or anti-feminist. Surveys asking yes or no about identifying as a feminist have found far fewer identifying with the movement, about 20% since the 1990s. The gap likely reflects the public's conflicting feelings about the movement, with many seeing themselves somewhere in the middle. Finally, in the interest of full disclosure, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the sampling because people might want to raise objections to that in the comments below because men were underrepresented in terms of compared to women. But I want to read out the survey's methodological logic so that you can see the ways that they made sure that women's views weren't overrepresented in the total results while being reflective of subpopulations of women in the broken out by cohort results. This survey employed statistical weighting procedures to account for differential chances of being selected due to landline and cellular phone access and household size. A propensity weighting was used to correct for differential participation rates among different segments of the pre-screened sample. Weighting also adjusts for deviations in the survey sample from known population characteristics, which help correct for differential survey participation and random variation in samples. The overall adult sample was weighted using a ranking procedure to match the demographic makeup of the population by sex, region, age, education, race slash ethnicity, marital status, and population density, according to estimates from the Census Bureau's March 2014 supplement to the current population survey. The sample was also weighted to match phone estimates of the share of the population who are cell phone only, 
landline only, and mixed user populations, according to the National Health Interview Survey. All error margins and tests of statistical significance have been adjusted to account for the survey's design effect, which is 1.6 for this survey. The design effect is a factor representing the survey's deviation from a simple random sample and takes into account decreases in precision due to sampling design and weighting procedures. The sample size and margins of sampling error for key subgroups are shown in the table below. Other subgroups are available by request. Note that sampling error is only one of many potential sources of error in this or any other public opinion poll. To read from the table in terms of the group total, the total sample size for everyone was 1,610 with a margin of error of 3 percentage points. For women, the unweighted sampling size was 1,122 with a margin of error of 3.5 percentage points. For men, the sample size unweighted was 488 with a margin of error of 5.5. Well, guys, I thought that that was an interesting collection of results and certainly one that counters the narrative we're used to hearing on YouTube, that nobody's a feminist except blue-haired, radical campus types, and that feminism is somehow being discredited in the wider population, and nobody's a feminist anymore. Quite clearly, that is not the case. And if anything, these numbers show to me that women under the age of 34 are more engaged than my cohort was, than my age group was. That means to me that feminism is going to be an active social movement, political movement, critique of modern society for decades to come. Thanks for your time and attention, guys. I've been Christy, and you're always awesome. And I'll see you soon. Bye.